Good morning, my name is Rachel Cooley. I'm willing to assume that everyone knows, by definition, that Fairyland is an enchanted and beautiful place. I'm also willing to assume that everyone knows just as well, by definition, that the real world isn't like that. This world is only natural, we think. We can explain everything in terms of impersonal, unchanging physical laws. It's the calculated functioning of our mechanistic world. But I want to question why we think this so implicitly. So if you'll bear with me, I want to offer a story from the far-removed place of Fairyland itself. In the novel Fantasties, George MacDonald tells the story of a man named Anatos who really did find himself in Fairyland one day. Anatos journeyed in a land bursting with beauty and enchantment. In Fairyland, there was meaning and magic and music in the stones and the trees and the flowers. But then one day, because Anatos defiantly opened the wrong door in an ogre's palace, Anatos' shadow found him. A dark, parasitic shade attached itself to him, posing as his natural shadow, and it recolored his perception of the world. Fairyland itself was suddenly gray and flat. He was still in Fairyland, but he looked and he could not see the beauty. His shadow disenchanted his view of the world. Christians today are in just the same position as Anatos. We inhabit a world that is much like Fairyland, but far too often, all we see is a machine. I am referring to our cosmology. A cosmology is a paradigm one has for explaining the essential functions and purpose of the universe as a whole. For an example, one would say that the cosmology of the ancients primarily explained the functions and purpose of the universe in terms of a plethora of divinities. The ancient Greeks, for one, explained the cycle of the seasons in terms of the story of Persephone. She was abducted by Hades, god of the underworld, but her mother, Demeter, the goddess of the fertility of the land, was able to bargain with Hades so that Persephone could spend a portion of every year in the upper world with her mother. The summer is when Persephone is with her mother, and Demeter's joy abounds to bring life and vitality to the whole earth. And the winter is when Persephone is in the underworld, and her mother's grief is expressed in the coldness and death in all of nature. Informed modern Americans, however, know that the seasons are really only the necessary result of the angle of the Earth's axis of rotation. Summer is not about joy, and the coldness of winter says nothing about a mother's grief. This is our cosmology. As modern Americans, we think about the world significantly in terms of what I will call a mechanistic cosmology, meaning that we think of the world as fundamentally like a machine calculated, unchanging, governed by physical necessity, and above all, impersonal. This understanding is seeped into our culture. But there is an alternative cosmology that I will call a sacramental cosmology. This is the paradigm that recognizes that this world is a living symbol of the character of God, where everything is unbreakably connected back to the life of God. The world is not inanimate, but intimate, a means for us to come to understand and experience God's glory. By this cosmology, the world is truly full of profound mystery and meaning. It is enchanted with a connection to God, for he is active in every layer, every moment, and every daisy. A recent advocate of this cosmology would be the incomparable G.K. Chesterton. He wrote that from his childhood he knew that there was something personal in the world, like in a work of art, and whatever it meant, it meant violently. But most Christians today don't think of the physical world as meaning anything. The contemporary American church needs to re-embrace the beauty of a sacramental cosmology. Our mechanistic cosmology is fundamentally secular. It is fundamentally opposed to the Christian worldview. I am seeking to diagnose a deep cultural issue within the church. The contemporary American church has imbibed a fundamentally secular cosmology. 
I hope to convince you of the sinister nature of the mechanistic cosmology by making two historical points through the story of the rise of this cosmology. First, that Christians of earlier eras did not sus subscribe to this mechanistic cosmology. Second, that the mechanistic cosmology arose because of fallacious departures from traditional Christian thought. Then I will address a counterpoint. And lastly, I will seek to show that the scriptures reveal a rich sacramental cosmology rather than a mechanistic one. So first, the story. The clean sea breeze of the centuries is helpful to weaken the hold of this mechanistic cosmology because the faithful of earlier eras understood the world in an entirely different way. Generally, medieval Christians understood that the whole universe was pulsing with the life of the Spirit and that the physical world was by necessity brimming full of God's presence actively sustaining every physical thing. This rich cosmology is exemplified on both philosophical and cultural levels. Philosophically, the medieval outlook was primarily characterized by St. Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas' cosmology was built upon his view that God's existence was not of the same kind and quality as the existence of all other things. Rather, God's existence was necessary, a precondition for the existence of everything else. So in some mysterious way, all creation, the cosmos, was contained within God's existence. To put this understanding in more familiar terms, God was understood as the I Am, in whom all creatures live and move and have their being. In this view, God was necessarily personally connected to all of creation. Consequently, this mindset, which was the accepted model for Christian thought across centuries, is entirely incompatible with a mechanistic cosmology, which thinks of the world as impersonal and self-sustaining. On the cultural level, generally, medieval Christians saw every item and aspect of creation as partaking in deeper meaning. There was no vast chasm of separation between physical realities and spiritual realities. They were seen as inherently interconnected. James S. Taylor describes the culture of the Middle Ages as one defined by a grasp of poetic knowledge. Poetic knowledge is a somewhat experiential knowledge of these interconnections between layers of reality. Poetic knowledge can be understood as the counterpoint to scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge is knowledge about how things function, but poetic knowledge comprehends the meaning, place, and purpose of the thing. Thus, a grasp of poetic knowledge brings with it the enchanting conviction that all things, even everyday things, are rich with significance because they are all connected back to the divine. They are all gifts from him, which only exist through him, and which derive a beauty and a purpose from being inescapably connected to him. In this view, it is the most sensible thing in the world for the consideration of a sunset, a grape, or the absurdity of your own feet to be a spontaneous catalyst for childish joy and wonder that is really a form of worship. Medieval Christians, then, governed by an understanding of poetic knowledge, recognized a thickness to reality that goes far beyond the mechanical functions of our scientific model for the world. They understood the sacramental role of the universe. However, this beautiful cosmology gradually began to fade from the minds of Western Christians. Now, history is full of jagged edges, but the change really became pronounced with the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. The core of the shift towards a mechanistic cosmology is due to what is known as a reductionist fallacy. Towards the end of the Middle Ages, scientists like Galileo began to make truly revolutionary discoveries about the structure of the universe. Now, I am not taking issue with Galileo's scientific discoveries. I believe fully in heliocentricity. But the poison is in the philosophical stance in which he embedded his scientific discoveries. Galileo worked from the perspective that only quantifiable aspects of the world really objectively existed. 
He said that the book of nature is written in only mathematical characters. So any aspect of creation that did not lend itself to numerical expression was considered ephemeral and less true. Among other consequences, this stance poses serious questions for the manner of existence of spiritual things. The spiritual was, in the very least, very far removed from the real world of quantifiable matter. Here is where the reductionist fallacy began. Reality was reduced to only its quantifiable aspects. And this alienation of spiritual considerations from the physical world became even more pronounced during the Enlightenment. The vision for the day was to try to explain the world in terms of impersonal laws discovered by the scientific method. Nature became defined as impersonal mechanisms. In fact, to think about God in conjunction with understanding nature began to be seen as even harmful. Francis Bacon said that to assume, as did the ancient and medieval philosophers, that the world was divinely permeated was to bar the mind from insight into nature's actual forms. It is these Enlightenment influences that have secularized our view of the world. Even despite these historical points, however, to some, the mechanistic cosmology may seem above reproach for one simple reason, the plain and simple success of science. Science and a mechanistic cosmology do appear intimately linked. We may even be tempted to consider science to be, by definition, the study of the repetitive mechanisms of the natural world. And in all fairness, much innovation has arisen through science understood this way. Electric heating, airplanes, smartphones, why ought we question the foundations that have borne such fruit? Well, this question is answered when we differentiate the mechanistic outlook from science itself. The fact that we think of science almost exclusively in terms of mechanisms is itself a remnant of the fallacious Enlightenment influence. Science is not dependent on a mechanistic cosmology. In fact, science is hindered by it. While it may not have hindered the utility of science, it has hindered its significance. The mechanistic outlook overshadows scientific progress to appear to threaten God's necessity rather than reveal his character. When the repetitions in nature are seen as fundamentally mechanical and impersonal, the more we understand scientifically, the less room there seems to be for the personal involvement of the Creator. But this is all based on one assumption that we can discard and ought to discard without discarding the science itself. The study of the predictable patterns in nature does not have to be understood mechanically. Chesterton pointed out that all the towering materialism which dominates our modern mind rests ultimately on one false assumption. It is assumed that if a thing goes on repeating itself, it is probably dead, a piece of cloth. But Chesterton poetically puts forward an alternative explanation for repetitions that rather highlights God's presence and activity in the natural world. He makes an analogy from the energy of children, saying, because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again, and the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes every day feel like. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. Science is useful because nature is consistent, and as Chesterton put forward, nature is consistent because of who God is, not because the world must be a machine. 
science understood this way encompasses so much more rich significance. I hope you are beginning to see how realizing this perspective will foster a beautiful devotional awareness. And this is beautiful because it is biblical. The Bible knows nothing of cosmic machinery. Rather, it puts forward a cosmology that is sacramental, bursting with a sense of God's presence, character, and activity in his creation. This shows up when Paul addresses the people of Lystra in Acts 17. These people were certainly categorically confused about the nature of the universe, as they mistook Paul and Barnabas for the Greek god Zeus and Hermes. But to set them straight, Paul does not tell them how far away and immaterial and spiritual God is. Rather, he tells them that God witnesses himself through making the crops grow and through satisfying their hearts with food and gladness. Paul says that the joy of food and material blessing is a direct witness of God himself that ministers to the hearts of men. This is a sacred role that these mundane realities bear. This sacramental cosmology is even more directly expressed in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. How often we hear and quote this verse. But stop and think about what it is truly saying. Psalm 19 gives the example of a sunrise as a physical phenomenon that actually communicates the beauty of our immaterial God. A sunrise is scientifically only electromagnetic radiation bouncing through the atmosphere and ricocheting off water particles suspended in the atmosphere. Yet, it somehow mysteriously mediates a sense of the splendor of the invisible God. This is inescapably a sacramental role. Beyond this, all the Book of Psalms echoes with this rich sacramental cosmology. It is no coincidence that God chose to make such an extensive section of his divine revelation in the genre of poetry, which is a genre entirely built upon the poetic structure of the universe. The Psalms do not abstract God from his creation to the extent that Western Christians like to assume. God is described as thundering over the waters, breaking cedars and twisting oaks, as well as caring for the land and watering it. All these things.